Now, let me introduce our next speakers who will be doing a joint presentation. Kevin Bales is the co-founder of Free the Slaves and is a professor of contemporary slavery at Wilberforce Institute for Slavery and Emancipation, uh, University of Hull. His book, Disposable People, New Slavery in the Global Economy, has been published in 10 languages and was named one of the 100 world-changing discoveries. The film version of that book was awarded a Peabody and also Kevin uh, earned two Emmy Awards as a result of, of that work. Kevin Bales has advised the US, the British, the Irish, the Norwegian and Nepalese governments and would be probably the foremost expert on contemporary slavery today. Monty Dada is Assistant Professor of Political Science at the University of Richmond and author of uh, Anti-Americanism and the Rise of World Opinion Consequences for the US, for US National Interest, published by Cambridge. He is uh, in the midst of developing several projects, one of which on human trafficking and modern slavery, which we'll, we'll hear about today. Kevin? I was saying to Ron that I put him in a funny position that I could relate to because when I had my first academic job in, in England, many years ago I was hired half historian, half sociologist because of budgetary cuts caused by Mrs. Thatcher and uh, the historians were very peeved to have to lose a historian. So they gave me the job of teaching uh, modern British political history, which I had never studied, never read a book about it, nothing. And they said, you're the low man on the totem pole and we're pissed off because you're a sociologist, so you have to teach this. And I thought if I read really quickly, I'll stay ahead of the students. And then I discovered that in my class was uh, the oldest undergraduate in all of Great Britain. That there were actually articles about him in the press about this 88-year-old man or something like that who'd gone back to get a, a first degree. And that everything I was going to try to talk about in my class, he had been there and could correct me from his own personal memory. And, and, you know, and all I knew was what I'd read, in the, read in, the, in the history books. And so I, you know, I had that funny situation of saying, well, you know, these groups worked in this way. And you'd say, well, actually, you know. And I, I was in a, in a great pickle. And I wasn't trying to do that to Ron, but it was curious to, to hear all about social movements that I was actively participating in for the last 15 years. Um, and all the time kind of hoping to get back to the numerical and hoping to get back and to work with, with Monti and others to think about the methodological questions that have plagued us from the very beginning one of which is, of course, about the dark figure. Uh, one of which is clearly about, you know, how do we measure these crimes, which are hidden crimes. You know, most crimes are pretty hidden. This is a crime that tends to be very hidden, in, depending on the situation. But it's also got certain wrinkles uh, that make slavery. And I tend to use the word slavery. Trafficking, to me, is simply a mechanism by which a person ends up in a situation of enslavement. Uh, I appreciate that, that because of the, from the beginnings of this, of this current contemporary slavery movement, this fourth great, globally, the fourth movement in history on contemporary forms of slavery, uh, the words human trafficking were first used much more than the word slavery because the word slavery meant something in the past, whereas this new thing, particularly coming out at the end of the Cold War and the periods of globalization, this, with the transfer of people across borders is called human trafficking. People say, oh, what we have today is human trafficking, it's not slavery, that's, that's the stuff from the past. But in fact, if you look to see what happens to people as they're taken through a trafficking experience, it's that if it is trafficking, according to most of the definitions, they end up in a situation where they're caught, they're, they lose all agency, they're highly exploited, violence is used to control them, and so forth. It's simply a conduit by which a person is taken into slavery. So, to my mind, the definitional work uh, is, is very clear and has been uh, elucidated and clarified by Jean and his project, which has helped us to relocate in the, that in the 1926 convention, uh, U, uh, uh, League of Nations UN slash convention, so that, so that we can really fix a, a, a usable, both legal and operational definition of enslavement. So I tend to do that, and so do... I have to say some of the people like in the U.S. TIP office today, the Trafficking Persons Office, the director, Lou DeBaca, says, has said on record, this should not be called the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. It should be called 
the Office to Monitor and Combat Slavery, because that's really what we're talking about. So I'm going to use that word more than I use the word trafficking, because to me, trafficking is a process that you can discuss on one side, but this situation in which a person is being victimized is not trafficking, it's, slave, it's enslavement. It's coercive, forced labor, and you have this umbrella called slavery, and then inside of it you may have um, forced labor, you may have uh, different forms of debt bondage, which are in fact uh, meet the criteria of a slavery definition. You may have uh, other, other types of that. There's a lot of different names for that kind of abusive use. Trocosi, religious-based forced marriage to priests in Western Africa. I mean, there's probably hundreds, but you can put them under, if you look at the uh, fundamental attributes of what's occurring to the person, again, the lived experience, as Ron was saying, if you looked at the lived experience, you get a pretty clear idea about is this or is this not in slavery. Now, the reason why we've called slavery sort of the dark figure of the dark figure is though because it's got certain wrinkles about it that are make it a, a, especially dark. Right? Um, it's, it's unlike a lot of other crime. Uh, let me just talk through a couple of, a few of the reasons why it's unlike other crimes. For one thing, it's a relationship. Now, clearly a lot of crime involves having a relationship with someone, domestic violence and so forth, but it's a relationship at several levels. You know, it's an economic relationship because it, it almost is always, almost always about uh, economic exploitation of some form. It's uh, a social relationship because it occurs within usually a group of people. Sometimes a large number of those people are enslaved. Sometimes, for example, in the case of uh, domestic uh, slavery as a domestic worker, you're in a free family, but you're the one who's enslaved. And then to stay with the domestic, enslaved domestic workers, which we believe, and we think we have numbers, um, to be the second highest form of enslavement in the United States after commercial sexual exploitation, uh, often becomes a very emotional relationship because it's, you know, particularly the relationship between enslaved domestic workers and children within the family that they're enslaved. And this has been a very interesting psychological component to understanding those forms of criminalization. That's an interesting part of it, but of course relationships occur in a number of different types of, of crime. But there are some other things that take us even further. <clears throat> Victim surveys are based on the idea that, and often, again, implicitly based on it, it's rarely stated, are based on the idea that a crime is an event which occurs and ends in a fairly short period. So that when we think about a burglary, a sexual assault, a car theft, you know, it begins and then the burglary ends and it's 15 minutes later, the, the assault is 12 minutes later, the car theft is, what, wait, what was the name of the film? Gone in 12 seconds or something like six seconds, right? So it lasted six seconds. But um, slavery, enslavement is a crime that is open-ended. In, on the temporal dimension. It begins, and then it just goes until it ends. And there is no fundamental end point that exists for enslavement except that of the lifespan of the person enslaved. Now, there are plenty of ways that they will, it will come to an end. Police intervention, escape, you know, who knows, liberation of, by, a, by an injury, who knows how, what that, how it might end. But in terms of the functional way that you can, you know, that you can guarantee, that you, the only way you can guarantee it will end is with, is with the end of the life of the person enslaved. Other, everything else is, is, becomes a variable. Now this, this is why we, we actually struggle with how to term it, in term, uh, to talk about it in terms of victimization. And if, if you look, for example, at the largest crime victimization surveys, like the British Crime Survey or the American Victimization Survey, and you search through them for information about events, crime events, and length of crime events, you don't find it. They do not measure the length of victimization, even for the crimes that they record, for any of the crimes that they record. They refer to the crime event as if somehow they're almost all the same length. But that's it. They're, they're, they're not thinking about it in crime surveys. They're not trying to measure it in crime surveys. 
So we, we talk about it kind of as a process. And one of the reasons that we talk about it as a process is because it, 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 it has a history. It's long enough to have a history. And one of the things that's a bit confusing and confounding sometimes, particularly when you talk about sex trafficking, is that if you speak to people who have been victimized in enslavement from trafficking, what you discover is that they can end up being the victims of a large number of crimes and diff even different types of enslavement so that people who are trapped, lured into, drawn into a situation of enslavement end up in agricultural work for a season might then be turned, can we still hear me? I can, okay, I can put all my big voice there. That um, can, can then be removed because they're under total control. Because they've lost agency, they can then be removed from working in the tomato field and put into a brothel or sent off to do cleaning. I mean, it's all of that's possible so that you have these different types. Plus, you know, if you speak to survivors of this situation and you say, you know, let's walk through all the possible things that have happened to you, of course what you discover is... You know, enslavement was just a, a door that opened that took them into physical assault, sexual assault, all kinds of different other crimes have been committed to them and with them and around them, including coercive proxy crimes, right, that they were then forced, right. So it's, it's wonderfully complicated it, it's, but, and fascinating in its way, but yes, the idea that it's actually, a, you know, you open the box to any particular enslavement and you get a whole bunch of crimes that are interrelated and so forth. Um, so we're still working out how best to think that through as a, as a process. Now, here's calling on the great work of Robin, Sean, and others. When we were wrestling with these questions about definition that, that Sally was talking about that's occurring with corporate crime, we're beginning to achieve some sort of unity around the, the guidelines. And I argued a lot with Sean about this, and I didn't think he was right, but he convinced me he was right, and in fact, I got with the plan, finally. And, and have now begun to understand that if we use the 1926 property-based definition, you can operationalize that in social science as well. But that's, that's not the key thing. I just wanted to compliment you, because I'm very excited about that work. But the key thing that I wanted to point to is that within those guidelines about how we can define this, you know, one of the things that we put in there is the fact that it's a period of time which is for that person indeterminate. Now, what's interesting is that if you go to the law of slavery, very, very rarely does it actually say that in laws against slavery or trafficking or so forth. They, you know, they say this is a crime to do this, force, fraud, coercion, use in this way, but they never says, and this is a particular crime that's marked by the fact that it is completely indeterminate in the length of time that it can occur. So the, the, what, I, what I'm trying to get at is just that <laughs> it's just not mentioned. It goes without say. It's as if we're all supposed to just know that. And in a sense, we do, because we understand slavery in history, that we just sort of understand that, gosh, slavery takes place over a long period of time. But then we almost forget it as criminologists, sociologists, <laughs> legal scholars, anti-slavery workers or, or, or whatever, because when it then comes time to try to measure it, people are treating it as if it's a, a discrete event and not as this life course event, if, if you could say it that way. So it's, it's kind of a paradox, right? The unlimited link goes without saying, but it's unacknowledged. So in, in a sense, it's as if it had never been said in the fact that when you try to get look at the criminological statistics about slavery and trafficking, they don't ever put that out and say, well, now as a preamble, we just need to remember that we have this problem. Now, the reason why we then say slavery could be the dark figure of the dark figure is because, let's go back to victimization surveys, which are our very best measure, way of measuring a dark figure to get an idea about what the dark figure is. And, and when we understand that those are, are based absolutely and perfectly upon the concept of crime as an event, 
so that you, know, you show up each year with a randomized survey and say, you know, did someone steal your bicycle? Did someone steal your car? You know, whatever. And did it happen in the last year? It was an event. Well, not only does the crime of enslavement remove itself by not being an event, but of course, who, who is in fact also removed? The victim themselves. You can't identify and interview victims of a crime who are in the process of victimization. Because I think it wouldn't pass the IRB. Right? Okay, that was a joke, but the point is that, you know, it, it would, you know, if you're saying, excuse me, Mr. Slaveholder, I appreciate you need to abuse this man right now, but I just have six questions. No, it's impossible, you know, if you're in an impossible methodological position if you're literally trying to determine victimization from a victimization survey in which you're supposed to be interviewing victims who can't be interviewed because they are in the process of being victimized and the nature of their victimization is to hold them incommunicado and completely control them and reduce their agency to the point that they are unable to speak in the vast majority of situations. So it's a, it's a double whammy of length of time and the nature of the victimization is one that removes them from access most of the time and creates terrible ethical board questions. So, that's this, what we're calling the kind of temporal paradox that underlies the, the dark figure of the dark figure. But it's also important to just point to the fact that we understand that there's also in reported crime, and the, doc, the, the literature on this is long and pretty deep, that if you look at dark figure numbers for different types of crime, and you see that there are anomalies to, well, we all understand the, the rule of dark figures, right? The rule of dark figures is that the greater the severity of the crime, the smaller the dark figure will be. I just, there may be students who haven't heard about this, so I'm just going to make that clear. So that virtually every murder gets reported. If your bicycle is stolen, well, who's had their bicycle stolen, right? Yeah, see, a lot of hands will go up. But then if you say, who reported your bicycle stolen? One, yeah, one out of the ten who put their hand up. You know, the, the lower the severity of the crime, the larger the dark figure, because it's considered to be kind of hopeless to even report it. But we also know that there are anomalies in the rule of dark figures, particularly when it comes to sexual assault, for all kinds of reasons that are, in, that are really understandable to us. You know, that rape is stigmatizing, there are all these cultural overlays to sexual assault. We know about this in criminal stats, that it's hard for people to report, even when asked in a victimization survey, which is very sensitively done, to admit, I was raped, I was sexually assaulted, or, and so forth. Right? And we actually have some pretty good numbers, uh, particularly in, uh, in Great Britain, from the differences between the British Crime Survey uh, in, what they, in what's reported to, uh, for sexual assaults there, and then some other more qualitative, careful lived experience studies which suggest the underreporting is 40% in some situations, even higher as it becomes more severe and so forth. So we've got stigma. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to encapsulate all that into a single word, which is really not doing it justice. You know, there are whole books written about the fact that why people who are sexually assaulted have really, you know, all kinds of, all kinds of reasons, with treatment by police, law enforcement, their cultural milieu, what their family's going to say, what do they say to the kids and so forth, uh, about why that happens. But I'm just going to reduce it down and point out that, again, this is more, this is not so um, underpinned by statistical evidence. But I can tell you that if you work in, with groups that are working with survivors, victims, if, as, as it were, but survivors of trafficking and slavery, one of the things that becomes very clear, if you're especially looking at this as a global crime, is that uh, the dichotomy between some kind of sex trafficking and labor trafficking is a pretty false dichotomy. Because to my estimation, and I, I feel so clear, but I can argue this 
um, which I won't do at this moment, but I think I can argue it and support it very easily, that I've published this as well, is to simply point out the fact that virtually every woman who is caught up in slavery will be raped, will be sexually assaulted. And that's true whether she's in an agricultural situation or a factory situation or a domestic service situation. When we've, when we've interviewed survivors across all types of enslavement, you know, they say, well, I was a maid, tell us more about, you know, ultimately it will come out, I was also sexually assaulted. And the same goes through. The work we, that Free the Slaves does in, in hundreds of villages of hereditary forms of collateral debt bondage slavery, but hereditary slavery, the entire village will be caught up in this hereditary slavery. They will have been working in, in a, say, a, a stone quarry for, for literally two or three generations. We'll tell the women anti-slavery workers after liberation, they will, they will explain, of course we were raped. That's what masters do, right? They control us. We were all raped. And, and in fact, in those situations, it's the women who lead the communities out into the liberation process when that opportunity presents itself. And when you talk to them about why in this incredibly sexist society did you take the position of power and lead, the women will say, because I didn't want my daughters to be raped the way I was raped. So we, you know, we haven't really found a place in the hundreds of, ty of, of victims and survivors, actually the thousands now, that we've spoken to at length in, across many tens of types of enslavement around the world where women in slavery were not raped. And if, you, and if you also look at this historically, and you look at accounts of American slavery before the Civil War, but almost any other culture, you will find that owning a human being, and if that human being is a woman, it, it's, it's free sexual access. Okay, what I, I know I kind of hammered that point hard, but sexual assault, we know, creates stigma, which leads to underreporting, which leads to a hole in the dark figures for people who are in freedom. And I just want to be clear that it's virtually impossible to have a person who is caught up in that particular crime who is not going to be sexually assaulted. It's very high for men as well. It's not as high, but it's very high c compared to the rest of the population. The second thing is that, and this is, th that's all been covered in a lot of criminological statistical work. The second point, though, is an interesting one that we're just beginning to unfold, which is that having been a slave is a very psychologically stigmatizing state. And I can't point to long academic support for this, but I can tell you again that one of the things that, you know, working with service providers and working with those who work on slavery in the field is that we, we know that people who come out of slavery, uh, whether it's trafficking in Western countries or not, feel, it, feel a, an irrational shame very much like the fact that, you know, if you're randomly selected and sexually assaulted on the street, it's not your fault. We understand that. We understand that rape victims, it's not their fault. And yet, rape victims re often report the shame that they feel at having been assaulted. And yet, it's clearly, at one level, an irrational shame because they would do nothing to precipitate this crime occurring to them. They are a victim of a crime. You know, I don't go around feeling ashamed because someone stole my bicycle once. It's, it's a curiosity, but a very understandable one when you dig deeply into why and how that happens, the violation of person and so forth. But what's interesting is that you find that same level of irrational shame and stigma being applied by ex-slaves to themselves. So there's also a, even when they're out of enslavement, they often don't want to talk about ever having been in enslavement. So I just wanted to throw in that we were, we've been trying to pick, about, pick apart how the dark figure could be affected, comparing it to ones that we already know, factors like stigma, that we know are, will affect dark figures. Right? Um, okay, I think, I think I've done that clearly enough. Oh, Monty made me do um, slowly appearing slide here, and I, I was thinking, what happened to the slide? But it's because it slowly appeared. We, we, however, have something to offer today in the sense of an estimation of the dark figure. Uh, we've, been, we've been hearing how it's impossible from, from Ron, 
or really difficult from, from Sally. Um, and we, I'll, I'll just admit right up top that we, we have reached some estimations, but that we also appreciate that the foundation upon which we have built them is not probably built of granite, but perhaps more like uh, solid pieces of wood which might shake in the wind, right? But you'll see what I'm talking about in a moment, it's because we have to, where this is the first time this has ever been done, and so we've just, we've pushed our sort of limits of, uh, of, of how one might do this and use some extrapolation methods to, to do so. So how, what, what have we done? And, and we're doing this just for the European countries. Um, the first is that uh, this was, a, in a sense, a breakthrough uh, that, that was not down to us at all. Uh, a team based at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln in the United States uh, tacked Th added three questions to a large-scale random sample survey, health survey, in five Eastern European countries. Uh, and and you, as you can see, the uh, sample sizes were large enough so that we're actually able to say, and they were randomized well, so we're actually able to say these are representative samples. So the first question was, how many members of your close family traveled abroad because they were offered a domestic or nursing job, but on arrival, were locked and forced to work for an okay. Right. So clearly, uh, these, are, these were um, linked to the situations that were more likely to occur in those countries. You know, there's nothing here about debt bondage and agriculture or anything like that, but you know, it was like this. Um, the second question was, how many members of your close family traveled abroad because they were offered a job, but on arrival they were locked and forced to work in an enterprise on construction in the agricultural field for no or little pay. So this was, a, again, drawing a lot on what is understood about those countries because one of the things that came out of this was the very high level of the trafficking of men out of these countries, which had sort of been ignored uh, by, by other studies. And the third question was this, about travel to Bod, offered employment, but arrival in another country, passport was taken away, forced to work, to work, to work, Sorry, that's a misprint, um, in the sex business. Right? So this was getting at what is called sex trafficking. So out of the populations of these countries, we now have uh, a random sample survey estimation of what proportion of those countries were actually trafficked into a situation of enslavement. And if you take... Pennington, is Pennington at all is the, are the folks in, in Nebraska. And if you take their, their numbers and you say, okay, if, we, if, we, if, if we're assuming that this random sample survey is, is representative and we take the population of this country and then we take the number of people who answered yes to those questions and we're able to determine what proportion of the national population has been enslaved, this is what you get. And I have to say that as someone who's worked in the field, and I suspect that there are other people who've worked in the human trafficking field in Europe, will tell you, you know, if I had not, if I had hidden the numbers and I said, okay, which country is going to have the highest number? You would say, they would, people would say Moldova. Moldova is known to be a hot spot of, of human trafficking in Eastern Europe. And Bulgaria has always been known to be higher than Belarus and so forth and for a number of reasons but particularly Moldova, and Moldova you know, comes out not very much the, high, the higher one. Right? Now, this is phenomenal on one level, that they got this done. And, and uh, data nerds like Monty and myself got really excited when we saw this because we said, finally, there is a representative sample that we can draw on and begin to think things through in terms of how that happens. And I appreciate having these strange little fractions is odd, but, but the fairest, I mean, the, the best way to present this in ways that can be then used in statistics is to think about it not in terms of the total number at this point, but in terms of the proportion of the population of the country. Okay, so we're clear about that. Now, then we've got plus two, so it's kind of like the dinner invitation, plus two, you know. But we have, I've worked with, with governments and independently with the ILO on estimations for 
the United Kingdom, and for the United States. And the United Kingdom, you can see, is a very low, even much lower proportion of its population. But there's a, there's a clear reason for that. And I, I'm using now the most conservative, what I believe to be best measured, but not at quite the random sample level for the UK, of around 4,000 something that we, I think, are, are in, the United, in, in the UK in terms of in, in people who are caught up in slavery. So this aggregates all three questions? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah this break, aggregates all three questions. Can you break them down by type? No, I can't right now. Because this is a dark figure question. But, I mean, but, but we could get there. The authors don't present the sex trafficking figures separately from the other two types? Montage, do they? No. No, I don't think they do. And they, they've been incredibly, you know, forthcoming in, in explaining their methods so that we could concur with them. But uh, the fact that they even published these figures is phenomenal and that they're willing to discuss what they did in their methods. But I, I suppose for them, actually, they're, they're doing, uh, in conjunction with the International Organization for Migration, uh, a, a very deep follow-up study now just for Belarus. They're going into one of those five countries now and they're doing more follow-up work. Um, and they, they want to tease out what's been going on over X number of years. Um, so, so rather than going broader, they're going deeper to get at more of those micro foundations so that you know, they, they can tell the true story that might be very different in Belarus and, and any other nation. But, but the authors must have the data that just have presented. Data. Oh, they do. If yeah. Break it down by type. Yeah, they, well, and they do break it down uh, in, their, in, their, in the article that they published in a slightly different way, though, which ain't kind of suggests an answer. Uh, because one of the findings in terms of the, the, the discourse uh, that they wanted to put out there was, you know, the discourse was Eastern Europe is where women are taken and trafficked into prostitution in Western Europe. And that's, and that's all that goes on. And what they, what they discovered by using a household survey was that of the number of people trafficked uh, or the proportions that, yes, that there were, you know, in Moldova a lot of women were trafficked to the West to be enslaved into prostitution, in, in commercial sexual exploitation. But an almost equal number of men were trafficked East, primarily into Russia, and caught up in construction, agriculture, and so forth. So, you know, the focus on the commercial sexual exploitation, which came with the beginning of this current movement, and is now broadening, was very much backed up by this, the idea that, it, you know, the only thing, the only, ex, the only slave export from Eastern Europe wasn't women. It turned out to be men going in, in, in the opposite direction into, into um, construction and agriculture and so forth. those questions didn't ask where they ended up, so they must have had something in their data that allowed them to tease that out. Yeah, they did. Um, the, the UK number, I was, I was about to say, one of the reasons why it would be low is that it's the European country that's not, one of the one, two European countries that are not in the Schengen Agreement. So there is no free movement between Britain and any other European country. You, have to, you must cross borders, and they don't have land borders, right? So you have both the control of the, of the, of the lack of, of permeable land borders, like the one between the Czech Republic and Germany, where there's a lot of easy movement. You can actually walk through the forest and so forth. You can't walk across the English Channel and slip in quite the same way. Nor can you do as you, as you do if you're driving from Belgium into France, just wave as you go past a border post which doesn't do anything because it's Schengen, it's free movement, that doesn't apply to the UK. Everything is checked, even if in a cursory way. So Unless it, you're coming through the Republic of Ireland, yeah, which has yeah. always been a transit route for that yeah. reason. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly, you, you beat me to the punch on that. I was about to say, unless, but uh, uh, for the most part, it's a, it's a tighter border. And, and it's a pretty effective law enforcement system. You know, you, I don't want to get into comparisons about that too much, but we know that the corruption is, is fairly low in the United Kingdom compared to some countries where you might, where corruption is such an important part of it. In the United States, that estimate's based on a large piece of triangulated research as opposed to random sample research that we did with the Human Rights Center at Berkeley, um, calling on service providers, police and government reports, and, and several other sources to try to do a minimum estimate. And so that, again, it's a minimum estimate 
of people that we believe to be in the country and to be, and to be caught up in situations of enslavement, adjusting for uh, one of the things that, th that our research showed, which was that the average number of, the average length of time a person was enslaved who was able to talk about it in the United States was three and a half years. The, the range was actually six months to 28 years, but, the, but there was a big middle me median lumping of people who had been caught up and enslaved for about three and a half years. So we factor that in as well. We tried to adjust that and so forth. So what we've got are seven data points. It's a little crazy. Now this is where I, I want you to hold my hand because we're not going to step off a cliff exactly, but we're going to walk across a, a slightly uh, shaky bridge. Because in a sense what we've got is out there in the world, there is, there is a curve. There's some kind of a line or a curve that is the prevalence of enslaved people as a proportion of the population of each country. Now, we're working with a, a global database of about 162 countries. And we're at a moment where we can impose on that, that line, which exists out there, but we just can't visualize it yet. But we can at least today put seven points on that line. Now, if you put seven points on that line, and then you just draw a connection between those points, you probably don't have a true description of the line. I'm, sh I'm sure you don't have a true description of the line. <coughs> but this is this beginning, right? As we begin at what, you know, our, our ongoing job is to continue to refine the points for other countries so that we can begin to approximate closer and closer the, the line that actually exists in reality. Now, one of the ways that we have done that for this exercise is in fact to is to limit this this particular piece of information that, this paper that we're giving you just to European countries. We're also working with all we're looking at all the other countries as well, but we're just going to limit this to the European countries. And we do that by making a number of assumptions, and then we begin to extrapolate within the ranges that we believe occur. We we believe that you can't go lower than zero. Right? That, and, we, and we actually don't think there is a zero. I used to say when I would give talks about global slavery, you know, it's in every country in the world except Iceland. And then someone actually called me from the Icelandic government and said, I don't know why you're saying that. We've got it too. You don't have to tell everybody, but we do. And we haven't found a country that doesn't have some form of trafficking and enslavement. So, you know, but, but we're also we're assuming that, that the UK is probably the lower end of the range, even though the range doesn't go to, 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 to nothing, to zero. We, we think that Western European countries, traditional Western Euro European countries, have much more in common in terms of law enforcement, economics, and so forth with the UK and the US than they do with the Eastern European countries. So we, we, we take a mean of, of these richer, slightly less, less corrupt, eco more economically similar countries, and we use that as a proxy for the other Western European countries. We know that that's off, that there's a difference, there are differences between Spain and Italy and France, just to point at the big ones, that um, we, we are sure exist, but we think we're, we're, again, we're falling in the right kind of range. That we can use a mean of these five Eastern European countries as a way of estimating and approximating the other Eastern European countries. And on the basis of that, which is a form of extrapolation, and which is also one that we checked by looking at arrays of other descriptive variables for each country, trying to make sure that countries with similar GDPs, economic trends, law enforcement capacity, and so forth, were grouped together on the basis of these extrapolations. Now, we then, and this is where I, I get to point to Fiona de Hoog, you know, said, let's, who's, who's our research assistant, you know, she had the, the tough job of going out and finding all the reported cases for the European countries. You know, the idea that, that the dark figure is the difference between what we estimate it to be for the reality and what the reported cases are, of course, and what Fiona would tell you is that it's a tough job because there is no uniformity of reporting. 
there's just no uniformity of reporting across European countries. So we've, we've also taken an assumption that we will be gentle with these countries. And if some of them are talking about prosecutions, some are talking about uh, convictions, some are talking about simply reported cases to the police, on and on and on like this, right? You have all these different subsets of the way that they're phrasing it. But we're saying, okay, if you've got a number, we're not going to say if it's only reported but not con uh, prosecuted, we're, we're going we're to lump them, right? We're going to try to try to let any number that could reasonably be a case of an enslavement or a trafficking case, we're going we're to let it stand for the moment. Um, and even then, some of them are a bit vague and it's hard to understand and, and so forth. But if you go to the OECD, the U.S. TIP reports, who, who have got their embassies talking to people in the governments and so forth, as well as the national government reports and anything else that you can find, but not press reports, because you never know what you're going to get from them. It's, it's the official. Then if you take those together and you take our either measured or extrapolated numbers together, you get this, and I appreciate that this is a really hard table to read, and I, I don't think, I'm, so I'm going to read it all aloud, right? No, I'm not. I'm, not. Yeah. Right. I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm gonna just point to a couple. Um, there's a couple of things going on here. I think the first thing to do, though, is to look at the far right number. Well, that's the actual dark figure number. That is, you know, what proportion of this crime, according to our estimates, goes unreported? And you can see it's, it's a crazy high number. It's, it's in, in the British Crime Survey, these are the kind of numbers that you get for theft of milk from the doorstep, right? which goes up into the 90s, right? Of, because no one reports the theft of milk from the doorstep back when you used to have milk delivered to the doorstep. Uh, but there are other, some countries like uh, the Netherlands and Norway where that dark figure actually is, falls pretty significantly. Uh, so that, that's the first, that's the dark figure estimation for European countries. The, then I go um, over to the reported cases, the reported victims, uh, and point out, you know, these are the numbers that we've been able to pull much closer, Ron, to the numbers that you are showing for places like the United States, where, you know, we, we think, according to the percentages, the extra extrapolated numbers that we've got, that there's something like 4,400 people who are caught up in an enslavement situation in the United Kingdom, and we can point to 712 uh, people who have come through an official <laughs> process that you would call the other side of that number that, that would allow you to do that. And, and, but for the most part, the estimation of the number of people who are enslaved by country is based on the, the numbers that are derived out for the, obviously for the five countries that had random sample surveys, you know, like Moldova with 34,238 slaves, that's actually a fairly hard number because they have said in Moldova, on the basis of a random sample representative survey, that this proportion of their population has been through this experience, one of these three experiences that ended them up in a situation of enslavement. And then you can multiply that fraction by the population and get to 34,238. Is that precise? Absolutely not. What's the uh, margin of error? We don't know, but at least that's a random sample survey. So if, you know, I, I feel comfortable to say it's at least 10% the margin of error, but there's a lot of the definitional things and so forth. For the others, the margin of error would be increasing, you know, but I, we don't think it's going 100% or anything like that. We think it's, it's still in two digits, and it, I'm, we're hoping it's, you know, it's, it's, it's closer to 20 than it is to 80 or anything like that. Um, than that, than this one. It, it, it also suggests when you sum it all up that out of the seven, 745 million people in all of these in the European community that there could be something like 1.1 1, 1 .1 people who are caught up in slavery who are enslaved. I just add a footnote. I noticed that Belgium and the Netherlands have fairly low numbers. 
And those are the two countries on the list that have legal regulated prostitution. Yeah. It'd be interesting to figure out if that's correlative or causal, though, right? Because. Uh, but so does Germany, and the numbers are really high. So yeah. it's legal in Germany, and the numbers are still yeah. really high. Now, we haven't had a chance to take. It's, I mean, one of the things that's exciting is because we've, we've only just really worked this out, and, and uh, kind of in honor of John for this conference, but the idea is that you know, it begins to open up a lot of very interesting policy questions, uh, assuming it's. It's going. Now, where do we go from here? And then, I, and then I'll open it up because I need to quit soon, right? Have to. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's clearly, and one of the things that we're pushing for very hard is simply to get more solid, random sample, representative surveys done in different countries. And we're working on ways to do that. We're talking to governments. We've uh, been able to identify some surveys done by the ILO. Uh, so we now have data for Niger, for example. Uh, for what it's worth, and I have to admit it's not worth a lot, but using our extrapolation method uh, where we adjusted for external variables and so forth, but then used the base estimates to extrapolate out, we had estimated a, a number for Niger based on, based on our extrapolation methods. Then we received the ILO data. And we had, a, and it was a great validity check, and we felt really um, kind of proud of ourselves. Though the next one will kill us, I'm sure. But this one was, we were within two percent of the of the, the numbers recorded by the ILO for Niger, which was that was so close, it, we couldn't hardly believe our good luck. But um, we're, now we're, we're very anxious to see if our extrapolation methods, we, we need to have them checked by say five or six more external random sample surveys to see if our extrapolation methods are working out. So, voila, <laughs> as they say uh, in some countries. Uh, I bet there's some questions about this, and I bet somebody was going to say, this is, this is crazy. I mean, this is, how, how dare you? Let's, let's in see. which case, it's Monty's question. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much to, to Kevin for that presentation. <laughs> I understand what you're asking. I think I would say this is not about neoliberal approaches, and I do not think this is about globalization and exploitation in the, in the South. And I'll tell you why. Uh, the, the, the why is simply this. If you go to the field in the global South and you look to places where people are caught up in things like hereditary forms of enslavement, they do not feed, they do not feed into global economic markets. Most slavery in most countries that where we've worked directly, you do not find integration into globalized markets. It's local economy stuff, bottom of the ladder, dirty, dangerous, demeaning types of, of, of low, very low level activity. Some does. And of course, there's significant movements within this new movement to somehow particularly help the people in the north to think about their consumption patterns because, oh, only if, we, if we only bought the right things, we could, we could eradicate slavery. But in fact, no. You know, the amount of slavery that we find that flows into goods or commodities that flow into the global markets is such a minute fraction of those that we suspect to be caught up in slavery that... Is it, is it not ultimately a question of like doing a really crap job in the rural sector and then doing a slightly less crap job in a, in, in a different sector? It's people making a choice to do a crap job on the basis of... Health. Oh, I think you're confusing people who choose to have a crap job with somebody who has no choice. Let's be... I mean, I want to be really clear about our operational definition. If, if you can walk away this is the rule of thumb part. This is not the official definition or the legal definition. This is the rule of thumb 
when we're in the field. If you can walk away, even if it means you're going to die of starvation, then you're not in slavery. Slavery is when a person cannot walk away, where their agency is so dramatically restricted that they are under the control of another person. That person uses that control to normally to engage in economic exploitation. And, and because that is the fundamental definition of slavery throughout human history, is that one person completely or virtually completely controls the other person to the point that they can't walk away. I'm sure there's a, sorry, I don't want to pull this, I'm sure there's a bigger qualitative issue around 19th century slavery, which is linked to mercantilism, which is linked to the temporary force, because in the 19th century, the, the discourse of legitimation was provided by the church. Basically, you know, as it is today in many countries. So you think then that religion is as much to blame for contemporary slavery as it, as it was in the... I can't, I can't measure that quantitatively because I don't know how much slavery in the past was. Well, I can, I can answer you, though, easily in this way. You have a situation in which one person is under complete control of another and they're being exploited, in a, usually economically. That's slavery. In every country, every society, at every point in human history where that has existed, it has been packaged. It's rationalized and justified by economics, by religion, by politics, by ethnicity, by gender, by race, and so forth. Or a combination of all those factors. And today, it is rationalized and justified by different combinations of those factors. The packaging around slavery in every moral economy in which it's allowed to exist is exactly as diverse as it was in the past. It's true that at one point in human history in the American South, before the Civil War, there was a particular set of packaging that had to do with religion and race, primarily. But if you look across the 5,000 years of history that we have of enslavement on, in, in human societies, you'll discover that that rationalizing, justifying package varies very dramatically. Just a little final question. You can talk about um would tell you that the life course, people drop in and drop out of life, life course events very, very rarely is something that's actually fixed and um, static. Um, the life course is about you know, dropping in, dropping out, uh, people in, you know, engaging, disengaging. Or... Is a prison sentence then not a life course event? Um, you could say that, that, but in terms of, of you know, say, yeah. say, say a young person's participation in crime, it's, it's something they, they, they drift in and... Well, I, then so scratch that from what I said, if I've, if I've stepped on anyone else's sorry, nomenclature. Sorry, maybe you didn't right? mean in terms of... No, I didn't. Okay. Okay. No. Yeah. Sean? Yeah, I, I'm just I'm interested in your methodology. I see it quoted in a number of places that it's estimated there's 28 million in the world. 27. 27? 27. Yeah. Um, I just wondered how you apply this kind of extrapolation technique to on a global scale. You know, this is put in Europe, but I still don't really yeah. understand the methodology. Well, let, let me be clear that that 27 million number that I released in 1999 yeah. was not done in this way. Okay, that was something else. That was a secondary source analysis. I was using the same methodology that was then adopted by the ILO. Uh, though, Unlike the ILO, mine was reviewed by editorial boards and other methodologists, and we don't know what happened with the ILO because they won't say. So, but at least mine has peer review. I've behind. seen that figure used in the 2012 tip report as well. 27 million. Yeah. And yeah, because they they dramatic. they come to understand that there's only that's the only number that's got peer review, and they feel better about it. Even though I'm the, since I originated the number, I will tell you it's loose because it's a secondary source. What's exciting for Monti and myself is that we're using the same extrapolation methods to global estimation now. We're trying our best to build on other random sample surveys that are representative and extrapolate to some other countries by that. That number is going to be something more like 29, but don't quote me, because we're still working through all these equations trying to see where this is going to go. But this is the first time that, in a sense, there's actually a number behind the number even if it's one upon which an extrapolation is made. Does that help? Okay. Two minutes from now, right here, and then one time. Great. I would like to go back to one of your, the sources of the, of the numbers, and that's the household surveys in the European countries. Mm -hmm. And that, that's just two comments on that. Um, the first one is, the questions were like, has a member of your household experienced this? 
So what about if it's multiple members? Because a lot of the time, I mean, the families are big, it might be two people, three people, four people. Or the same one, over and over and so over that, again. So that, I would suppose, that wouldn't show in those, in that, those systems? Monta, do you know the answer to that question? I believe it's a conservative estimate, so that if there were multiple family members, I think it just got in a recording of one. I believe so. Because that could change the numbers mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And the second one would be, um, we know from migration research that a lot of the time people in, who are illegal immigrants or, or in some sort of you know, dodgy situation tend to not tell people at home out yeah. of embarrassment yes. or whatever. Yes. So that would also take Absolutely. the numbers significantly yeah. that the people at home might yeah. not even know. So yeah. it's just those two comments on the screen. Well, Suzanne, in fact, it was good because I should put that in as one of the mortifying effects with stigma and Sexual. You're right. Yeah. Good point. And um, I, I still, I, I still have trouble with the definition of slavery. So you said, if I got this right, um, if you can walk away, you're not in the slavery, right? So what about those? Well, that's a working definition. Let me be clear. This is a working yeah. definition. But when it came time to, to 15 years ago for mm -hmm. us to try to understand what slavery, mm -hmm. how how much slavery there was and how it existed and what was going on, we had to have a working definition that we could use in social science research. The, the legal definitions are no use because they're, a lot of them are, are written by committees of people who hate each other and they don't even add up internally. You know? So we also had to say, you know, we're going to make a working definition which is a, 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 a shiny, bright, hard line. Right? It doesn't mean you're like physically enslaved because the, then that means it doesn't include all those domestic servants we were talking about that earlier in like embassies or whatever. Because um, they can walk away, like they well, can like, leave the house. And now, interestingly, house. having having done a significant piece of research on enslaved domestic workers of di diplomats, I can tell you the majority of them could not walk away. I uh, the ones that I've interviewed and spent time with were locked into basements and physically assaulted. Mm -hmm. On one hand, and yet on the other hand, not, this is where the relationships part comes in. That was so interesting was that while they might have had an opportunity sometimes to walk away, this, the psychology of domestic slavery is very interesting because a number of them would say, I would not leave when I had that opportunity because I had to stay to protect the small children I was caring for. That was a repeated answer to why didn't you leave. And they'd say, you know, I worked for a man who physically assaulted me. I worked for a, a, a woman who physically tortured me. And I believe that if I had left the children I was caring for, they would turn that violence on the children, so I stayed to my own detriment. So you could say, I just We can't talk about your personal situation. We can't, uh, we can't go there. And no, I do not think you can do that either. I, you know, I, I appreciate that you want to lump, but I, I you will not lump. I'm, I'm going to split. Because there's also the situation in which people, millions is our guess, of women around the world are caught in situations of forced marriages which are easily meeting all the criteria of enslavement. And I don't want to try to blur that out. And we just, we were in the middle of a large scale project where we've been interviewing hundreds of women in Eastern Congo, for example, in the war zone, who are taken at gunpoint in the middle of the night, watch their children slaughtered, and then are taken off to be Wives. No, I, I know that. Yeah. It sounds like it's not a working definition. It is a definition. A working definition is something subject to change. So it seems to me this issue of definition. Well, it's a, yeah, it's it's certainly it's that, but it has changed over time, slightly. Okay. Yeah. But are you willing to say it's no longer a working definition? This is your definition. Of okay, I'll say it. it's my definition. But except I I now ad adopt his definition, so you have to like bother him <laughs> because. In fact, if you take the Bellagio Harvard Guidelines fundamental explanation and you set it next to the social science definition that we've been using, they just they, they fit like that, hand in glove. One uses the, the language of property law, but then when you say what does property law actually say, it says control, use, exploitation, and so forth. It has a whole series of criteria which match the social science definition in terms of its criteria. We can go. We can go into that. Let, let me call on one last, last question. Yeah. yeah. So I come from a placing background. So from sure. Back to your 4,400 figure will become fact probably by tomorrow. <laughs> and somebody will say there's 4,400 victims in the UK. Well, it's back to that point. Is, do we know what type of exploitation they're 
it's object of because that will drive where we're putting the resource to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm also conscious that it's based on three figures around cross border trafficking. Yeah, yeah. And it takes no account of any internal trafficking. Yeah. Which is a big issue that Absolutely. the UK around you consider child sexual exploitation. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I have to internal say, trafficking though is a very, very ambiguous area. And it brings with it a range of other problems. Because yeah. children who are used for the purpose of exploitation are actually groomed and abused and labeling that as trafficking um, actually isn't helpful to the figures at all. And, and, and again diverts attention from where it should be. And I have found your, your definition of can and um, you know that they cannot walk away and uh, to be really unhelpful and uh, have an engage with a number of victims in situations would have been rescued. The bars, as you describe them, are in most people's minds, and it's their it's their state of being at that time where they feel they cannot, um, and that, and that is slightly different. And I think from a victim perspective, um, it implies a physical um, barrier to, to, to leaving um, yeah. slavery, yeah. whereas that is not the case. We've been speaking at sort of high speed and in and in tight bursts of words, and I, and, and I want to make it clear that I don't necessarily disagree with you. I, I really don't, because there are so many situations, and again, I'm going to remove this all the way to Nepal, where I've met hundreds of people who, in hereditary forms of slavery, experience virtually no physical barrier. But after two or three generations of slavery, you don't need physical barriers, right? You know, they, they understand that my family has always belonged to that family, and that, you know, this is the way life is. It's, it's, even, it's even a sort of psychological space beyond that of, if I do this, something bad might happen to my mother or, or so forth. But, so I don't disagree. But let me just say, that, that British number doesn't come from the extrapolation. That comes from internal um, home office work that I've done with them. Uh, but again, in terms of how it's breaking out, I, that's a, oh, number's a little old. It doesn't, I don't think it's, it's right in terms of how it divides out. You know, the whole explosion of the use of Vietnamese children in cannabis factories was just beginning when that, we were putting that number together. So that's a very important thing to begin to keep as, it's a very dynamic crime situation. Let me just say that we'll, we are going to have a round table after our next presentation. We'll have a good more than an hour to have an open discussion about sure. things. Yes. And so with that in mind, uh, can we thank uh, Kevin and, and Martin?